keep telling everyone on the board, I'm like, we cannot be reactive. We have to be proactive. If you want to create a industry that's sustainable, we have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. We can't keep doing this reactive stuff. Oh, something changed. Oh, they figured out how to convert CBD to THC now. What do we do? Yeah. Right. Welcome to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top dispensary owners and experts in this space so that you can stay up to date with the latest trends and strategies that you'd otherwise miss out on. I hope you enjoy this episode. Bailey, thanks for hopping on to the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So uh, for those that are listening, can you please tell them who you are, where you're located, so and the name of your store? Yeah, I'm Bailey Stewart. I'm located in Wasilla, Alaska. I have multiple dispensaries. I was actually one of the first uh, licensees to open in the Matsu borough, um, known for Matanuska Thunderfuck. Uh, I actually teach at UAA. I was one of the first teachers they brought on, and I teach Canada Basics, and we're creating a degree program under the University of Anchorage, Alaska. I serve on the Alaska Marijuana Industry Association. Uh, as a board member and as a chair of the Public Relations and Governance Committee, I also serve on the um, Alcohol Marijuana Control or the Marijuana Control Office um, as the only industry member creating regulations and serving, uh, issuing licenses and etc. Crazy, crazy impressive. So we're about to dive into all of this stuff. Um, but the question I like to ask is before getting into, you know, all of this in the cannabis space, um, what did you get up to? Um, how was your transition, you know, into cannabis? So my transition was an interesting one. Um, I was just a recreational user and, but I continually struggled to find access to it. I mm -hmm. was a mom. I didn't want to have any issues. I didn't really drink or do anything like that. I just wanted a little cannabis before I went to bed every night. Um, so that really motivated me when I first saw some ballot initiatives happening in Washington, Colorado. I was looking to my peers up here and I'm like, that could happen up here. They call Alaska a purple state because we kind of go back and forth between um, a red state. We're typically red, but we have a lot of blue in us too. And so, and I was right. Um, and November 7th of 2014, we legalized cannabis in the state of Alaska. And that was just right after Washington's rollout. So um, after that point, me and my business partners went down to Washington when the first dispensaries opened up and we're like, what is a, what does an industry look like? It's right. just coming from, you know, this illicit market to this recreational market to kind of get an idea of what to expect in our own retail. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, you and your business partner went, went down to essentially scope the scene. Um, yeah. So did you have existing businesses previous to this? Did you say, hey, there's this really cool opportunity coming up and then you found some people to join you? What did that look like? So actually, these business partner are lifelong friends. Um, it actually took place in our kitchen. We were all nice. talking. We had been talking about doing business together for a while. We had been, you know, playing stock markets, 401ks, all of that. Um, we didn't own any businesses prior to it, which is, you know, they always tell you don't open a cannabis business unless you open businesses. <laughs> but I am that person and it was successful. Um, we just all kind of sat down for a while. We thought our local community needed an art store, but we weren't like, while we love art, we weren't mm -hmm. super passionate about it. And then, like I said, uh, those ballot initiatives started showing up and we're like, you know what, let's kind of hold out. Let's see how this plays out. And we were right. We, we legalized. Granted, we had some roadblocks. Um, we had legalization. We had a rollout of regulations. And then our borough decided to, or our borough mayor, I should say, decided to uh, put a voter initiative to ban recreational sales and businesses in our Matsu borough. And our Matsu borough is bigger than some states. So this was mm -hmm. a large piece of land in the state of Alaska. So then I had the opportunity to run a campaign um, for ballot measure one to maintain legalization in the valley and it was hugely successful so I spent a lot of time on the corner of a street <laughs> waving signs <laughs> and the Look. way they faced it was you had to vote no like voting yes would make it prohibitive oh. and if you voted no so they played that language so that created mm. another level of complexity to maintaining legalization um I got a couple of uh, your number ones on the side of the road thinking, you know, we were we were prohibitionists, but we weren't. Right. And mm. so that was quite a hurdle to overcome. Right. So, oh, man, I have tons of questions already. Um, <laughs> OK, you and your friends sitting at the kitchen table deciding what business you want to start. Right. Yeah. Um, this opportunity comes up and you're like, OK, boom, let's do it. 
did you have some sort of structure? Because I know, you know, friends, business, money, relation, like, you know, all, it, can, it can muddy the waters a little bit, right? It's like, yes, we're friends. So it's like, you know, if, if you show up late to going to the bar, that's fine, right? But if you show up late to work every single day when, you know, we have invested a lot of time, money and effort into this, it's a slightly different issue, right? So yeah. did you, how was that initial structure of setting up the business at the beginning? Was it like you had somebody that was like, boom, contract, contract, contract? Was it like, hey, we're really close friends. We believe this is going to work anyways. Like what was kind of like the genesis of, of, of all that? It was a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, we've all been lifelong friends. We knew each other for a long time. Um, right. One of them was actually my now ex-husband. Uh, so we were obviously very close right. <laughs> being married. <laughs> right, right. Um, however, I, there was contracts in place because we all sure. wanted to make sure that there was no issues if anything were to go ill uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that all those that we all felt safe with the investments we were making into the company and that there was ways out if any one of us want to get out because so it exit, was, nice. you know, cannabis is kind of a scary business, especially when you're the third state to legalize and what does it even look like? Um, so we had all those contracts in place. We just took it one step at a time. It literally was just one foot at a time and a lot of scary steps mm -hmm. where it's just like, oh, okay. Uh, we just took out that quarter million dollars that yeah. was for our future. Yeah. Um, so there was a lot of that, but there was a lot of looking at each other and trusting each other and recognizing each other's strengths and weaknesses. And that's where we found like our roles. Like I'm chief operations nice. officer. I'm very organized. I understand I can, you know, mentally, uh, I can mentally put everything together in what compartmentalized. Way. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> so that's super interesting because a lot of times when I think people get together, um, it's like, yes, we are close friends. Let's just start a business, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't want to stay on this too too uh, too long, but I'm just personally very interested in this. My podcast, so I can yeah, say, yeah. <laughs> you do what you do. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but no, like, um, so. Would you say like at the beginning of this, you each had your own individual skill sets that were more so complementary of each other than just identical, like I'm an operations person, you're an operations person. Oh, you're an op So it's just like a bunch of operators, but there's no like, you know, you know, sometimes you need the person that doesn't look at the operations, but just kind of gets the things done, right? They kind of break through the walls, right? right. Um, did you have those team, that kind of team put in place? Yeah, we, we were really uniquely set up where, you know, like I have all the back end, I have all the license, I've done all the licensure, I've, you know, done a lot of the ordering, putting together of the stores, whereas our CEO, Caleb, um, he was very much like the go-getter, the, the persona for the company who would go and be there and make sure that we were making all these connections because we had this weird interesting dynamic where we didn't come from that uh mm -hmm. legacy market is what i like to call it because it led it paved the way for us to be here um but we we weren't a part of that market so mm -hmm. we really and a lot of those people were coming from that market so we had a lot of relationship building and he was great at that so he played that role for us nice. and then we have chris ferris who was our chief uh financial officer he did he had all the money all the bookkeeping all the back end so we really were uniquely set to complement each other. It was a very unique situation and forever grateful for it. Nice, nice. So now fast forward, um, the way it worked was like a, like a lottery at the beginning? It did not. So Alaska is very, very unique. We were planning that they, we were like, first of all, we were like, please don't go lottery. Please don't go lottery. Right, because right. it doesn't really allow for a fair market sure. if you have license caps, because you could have, you know, just happen to have a whole bunch of bad actors. And then that's the people you get to choose to shop from. But yeah. in the state of Alaska, we have something called the permanent fund dividend. Have you heard about that? No, no, no. So it is a dividend that's divided among Alaskans that comes from our oil revenue profits. So every nice. October, every Alaskan gets a a check for the oil that's produced here in the state, but you have to be a resident of Alaska. That's they did the same process for cannabis licenses. So we are uniquely Alaskan owned and operated for the most part. There's interesting ways to set up corporations. And I know that's happening out there, but for the most part, you're Alaska owned, Alaskan mm -hmm. grown, Alaskan manufactured. There's no really, there's no one from out of state that could come and play here. Right. However, 
there will be an issue upon federal legalization um, due to the dormant commerce clause if that will be able to uphold in right. law. So right now we're Alaskan owned. You had to be Alaskan and we were able to prove that easily. So that's how our work. And we have no license caps currently. Mm -hmm. So once you've uh, kind of passed all those filters, you know, being Alaskan, living in Alaska, resident of Alaska, like what was the process then? Was it just like people applied and then somebody said yes or somebody said no? Yeah. So the Marijuana Control Board compromises of five board members. We have someone that represents rural because Alaska is huge. We have a lot of villages. We needed to have that person on the board. We have public health, obviously, public safety, typically held by an officer. Uh, we have a member of the public on our board. And then we have one marijuana industry. These five members created regulations and initiated the first licensing. Mm. So they, uh, you know, they went through the process of accepting these licenses and individually granting permission to start operating. Um, it's a pretty long process. To be to be honest, we opened CBD first because we're like, you know what? Like we have the Farm Bill of 2014 at the time um, and we felt that was legally to operate. We had, you had to have a lease before you could even apply. So you right. had to be paying for that before that happened. So we're like, well, we might as well sell CBD. And so when you, our licensing process was 18 months long just to get through it. How many people can come in with that kind of capital to sit there and wait and to go through that process? And it's I a maybe, right? It's not a get, it's, a, it's also a maybe at the end of this 18 months, right? It is a maybe, you know, like they could, to be, to be fair, the marijuana control board has, there's very seldomly have they not issued a license. Sure. And there's pretty good reasons when they do that. But other than that, they've issued a lot of licenses. Right. Um, it was a very unique process and uh, you had to represent yourselves and you went before the board and they went through your application and they were able to ask any questions of you, but it, it didn't end there. Once they uh, issued license, when they motioned to issue a license, you were in a delegated status where you still had to have enforcement come in, verify all your operational plans and signage mm -hmm. and all of that. Um, there was a lot of hoops to jump through to, to get it. Now, the process is much simpler and you're looking like at a 90 day period to get uh, issued a license. Right. So you mentioned you uh, own multiple stores. Um, <laughs> how long did it take to get to the second store? It took us about five years to get five to years. the second store. Right. And we were hesitant because the growth was exponential. Um, we kind of decided that during COVID, we, we took a risk. Mm -hmm. We went and opened. I'm actually at that shop right now. This is our Hatcher Pass shop that sits up against the mountains. Um, you know, it just took us time. We were really wanting to take it one foot, one, one foot in front of the other. A lot of people were opening up. We have mm -hmm. a very saturated market right now. And while this store is doing great, that can't be said for a lot of people that are being issued licenses right now. Right. And do you have a third store? I do not have a third store. So what would you say were the biggest differences from store number one to store number two? Store number one, I was literally number one. I had no <laughs> competition. It was a crazy experience. I yeah. still remember the day we opened the doors and, you know, you have that feeling like, I'm going to get arrested. I'm going to get arrested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that, you know, obviously that never happened. It was hugely successful. Um, we had a lot of amazing years, but we definitely hit that saturation of the market and Actually, what we're seeing right now in our particular valley is a big growth in um, the illicit market. So that's right. created some roadblocks for us recreational. We just can't compete with their prices currently because of our tax structure. Mm -hmm. We've been attempting to change that. But as of last night, um, that officially failed. So right. we're looking at having to restart that process in the uh, 35th legislature. Right. So what are your biggest challenges right now then? My biggest challenge is the saturation of market. Right. That's truly what's happening. Um, you know, you could you could have the best stores, but when you have so many for people to choose, and I don't mm -hmm. blame them. We, we shop on convenience oftentimes, so whatever's closest to us. It makes it so, as you know, currently we still are under the 280E. You have right. to have some, you have to have 
a certain amount of capital to operate these stores. And if you don't meet that, you're in danger of dying. So it's mm-hmm. this constant game of keeping enough customers coming through. We're only so big of a valley. We only have about uh, 10,000 people within the city of Wasilla. That's not a lot. But we got 19 stores in this borough. Right, right. So that, that's the hurdle to overcome. And I have some solutions for that here in the future. Mm-hmm. So beginning, everything was good. Um, you took a leap of faith. Yeah. Uh, lineups outside the door <laughs> um, yeah. because you're the only ones out. Second store in, um, people have kind of caught up to to really figure out what's going on, right? Yeah. Second store was 19. Right, right. So how have you kind of, would you say weathered the storm? Is that how you would say it is? Or would yeah. you say thriving? Would you say kind of, you know, making it out so that you can survive ahead of the other store so that when the other store is closed down that you guys are still up? Like, how would you kind of, you know, say where you guys currently are? I would say we're weathering the storm. Um, right. COVID really threw a wrench into things. We all started seeing a declination in sales. Right. Um, you can see it in our borough taxes. You can see it in the state taxes. Even the state right now, um, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars less than last year that's being spent at the stores. We can see this socioeconomic um, issues arising in our stores, especially when no one can use a credit card in our stores. So they need to have that cash on hand. And as I'm sure you know, not everyone has that right now. They're living on their credit cards. They're just, they're literally trying to weather the storm with us. So it's kind of a hard situation to be in. Yeah. Yeah. So what are your pillars then for trying to make sure that you're doing all that you can do at, as it currently stands? You know, obviously there's competition. Um, yeah. There's some would say price compression. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the amount of money that just people have cash on hand, just they literally just can't spend money um, right now. But what, what would you say that are your main pillars of making sure that as long as I do my thing, this is all I can do right now and I can hang my hat on that? Yeah. It's consistency of customer service. I know that my customers come in my store and whether they want to run in and grab something and run out or they want to have a conversation and be educated, they know that they can come to my stores. We're very reliable for that. It's a reliability of product too. Um, I separate myself a little bit that I'm very particular about the people I shop with or that I purchase my product with. Sure. Um, if I don't see how you treat your employees, how, what your girl looks like, what your cleanliness looks like. And I actually have an additional level of uh, when your product comes in my store, it goes under a microscope because things right. grow after the fact. Mm-hmm. And especially in summer when things get hot and humid, uh, we'll see like mold start to pop up mm-hmm. and I refuse to sell product that's moldy. Right. Um, so that's another way they, my customers know that the product of qu- the quality of product is there mm-hmm. consistently. Um, those are some of the ways that I separate myself. Right. Quality products is, is obvi- obviously like a, a massive, massive thing, right? Yeah. So th- there's a mix of bad product, gets to customer, customer blames you. They don't necessarily yeah. blame the vendor or whatever it yeah. is, right? So do you have like a, a general process of how you try to keep uh, the quality of product high? Because obviously you can't put all the products underneath the microscope. Um, no. But, you know, managing vendor relationships, you know, kind of what goes into your way of making sure that whatever product that comes into store is the highest quality that at least that you can make. Just, just like you said, it's managing vendor relationships. Mm. It's checking in with them, making sure that those processes are still in place. Um, it's knowing what, co- what quality of product they're uh, running. Right. I won't work with all manufacturers because not everyone is having the due diligence of looking at the biomass itself, um, as we both know that there's certain pesticides that can be concentrated in the concentrate process. It cannot be remediated like mold because of particular molecule size. Um, those are the, those are the manufacturers I work with to guarantee, because you're right, I can't take those under a microscope, but what I can do is have a healthy relationship with manufacturers that I feel overly confident that they're going above and beyond with the biomass that they're bringing in and running through their machines. Right, right. So I'm a vendor. I want to uh, get my product into your store. Um, what, what do I need to do to, to get your business? 
So to get my business, um, I would expect some samples to be able to see. And I take those. Um, sometimes I'll take some of them. My procurement, I have one guy that does all my procurement. He's mm. amazing. And then we distribute it among our bud tenders because the bud tenders are truly who sell that product. I tell vendors oftentimes, you can sell it to me all day long, but I want you to go talk to my bud tenders, educate them about you. Let them get to know you mm -hmm. because they're the people that are going to be like, I met this awesome person, um, Brandon. He he creates the best products. Uh, he came in the other day. He shared that with me. Uh, I had this particular cartridge. I swear by it. It might be a lower percentage, but I'm telling you to try it out. And oftentimes that customer goes, you've sold me a lot of good stuff. I'm going to try that. That's, nice. that's really where that relationship's at. It's with the butt tenders. Right. So th that, that kind of takes me to my next question. So vendors is one side of the relationship uh, and then managing staff, right? Managing bud tenders, general managers, you know, um, procurement, um, all of these things kind of go into also making sure that the business runs, you know, really well. So how do you manage your relationship with your staff? So I'm the, I'm the owner that shows up. I'm not the, you know, the owner that you don't see. I come mm -hmm. in and I check with people. I tell them, when I'm hiring people, I tell them you're hiring me just as mm -hmm. much as I'm hiring you. This is a working relationship. Um, oftentimes my interviews, I can teach you everything you need to know. Mm -hmm. What I can't change is your personality or the way you use way that you handle conflict. So that's oftentimes what I'm interviewing for because I want to have a healthy relationship with my team in my stores. And that's number one. If my, if my staff is having a hard day and they're taking out on customers, that's a big deal for me. Like that's not okay. That's why I try to keep food in my break rooms. I do mm -hmm. a lot of things to make sure that my staff's happy. I also offer vacation time, paid time off because I feel truly, how can someone be their best if they're not able, able to afford that time to be a human? We, at the end of the day, my butt tenders and my managers, they're not robots. They're humans interacting with other humans. So I take care of my humans and they take care of my customers. And that's, I have a pretty awesome relationship with them because of that. You sound like awesome, an awesome boss. Yeah, thank you. I try to be. <laughs> you know? I know it can be hard because, you know, yes. you have your customers, then you have, you know, John, the bud tender. And again, right, people have bad days. And just yeah. one time, they just might not be, they might be a little snippy with a customer because the customer might have been, you know, a, you know, for lack of a better word, a dickhead, right? <laughs> so, you know, and you, you can, you can, you, you know, you can only expect so much and then boom, you get a Google review saying how rude John the bud tender was and, and it turns into this, to this big spiral, but it sounds like you're doing an awesome job. Again, just managing the things that you can manage, right? There's things that, that are outside of our control. But before we get into that, I've realized that after all of these interviews, dispensary owners need a safe space where they can ask the questions that Google doesn't have the answers for. So what I've done is I've created the world's first dispensary owners mastermind group, where it's an environment of like-minded individuals who can help make each other's lives easier and also make more money in the process. So if that's something that you're interested in, please check out the links in the description below. Now on to the rest of the show. I would love to hit on that subject actually, because yeah, I do. think oftentimes people are like, ah, oh, that rude customer that came in or that bad review. Those are actually the best opportunities to gain a lifetime customer mm -hmm. because, you know, people have bad days. People have died that, you know, they they have worldly problems that we don't see when they enter those doors. Right. And I have time and time again, when that rude customer comes in, I tell my staff, kill them with kindness because offering that kindness when they're being not necessarily the best human oftentimes sends them back to their car, to their home. And they later, later on, they sit that day and they reflect on how they were treated in that moment. I can't tell you how many people have come back and praised us for how we handled them. And they've created, and I've created lifetime customers because of that, because we handled them when they weren't necessarily the best selves or when we would get that bad review. I actually kind of like getting those bad reviews because oftentimes I know that my staff haven't done anything wrong. I've heard mm -hmm. the back end of it and people kind of, you know, they'll throw a fit, but it gives me an opportunity to show my future customers how do I handle myself in adversity? And I've actually had people come in just because of those situations that they looked at my Google reviews and they're like, you handled yourself really, really well. And I go, thank you. Everyone has a bad day. Right. That's okay. All right. 
No, that that's awesome. That's awesome. So it sounds like you also have a very good way to, again, convert the people who may have now never, ever gone back to your store um, into a way that they come back to your store essentially permanently or for as long as possible yeah. anyways, yeah. fingers crossed, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the market's what... too saturated to let those relationships go. <laughs> exactly. I, you know, every customer means a lot. And, and I say that a lot to people who uh, come to me and they ask for just kind of initial advice on like grand openings. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of people can get caught up in the oh, sale, sale, new people coming in and for even on a 420 day where you have a lot of people coming in. Yeah. And it's I find a lot of people, they focus on that that first sale. Right. And it's like, OK, yeah, they're coming in. We're getting a bunch of customers coming in. But if you don't give good product, if you don't give good customer service, if you just don't give an overall good buying experience the first time where you have all these customers coming in, they're not going to come in a second time. Right. And that's when you have the problem. It's when your customers who come in the first time don't end up coming back the second time. Yeah. And then you're in a world of trouble because the competitor down the street, they're going to have somebody that says something with a smile. They'll, they'll go to you. They'll go to you. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and then they'll, exactly. they'll come back and, and then they'll stay. Right. Yeah. So um, one piece of the puzzle is vendors. Another piece of the puzzle is the relationship with staff. And then obviously the last piece of the puzzle are customers. Right. And it sounds like you have an excellent way of retaining your customers once you get them in. Uh, what would be your general marketing mix to get people in the store who may or may not have heard from you before purchased from you already? So I've done a, I've done a mix of things where I've, you know, I've had advertisements in newspapers and magazines. But truly, in my particular region, it is word of mouth mm. here. It's, I, I go around and I represent my company every day. I go, hi, like, you know, they get to know me and I go, yeah, I'm the owner of Green Jar. And I build those relationships. You know, I show up at the borough, I show up at government, I show up. And oftentimes that is what is helping me more so than my magazine advertisements, my newspaper advertisements, my radio advertisements. I've really done it all. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd say my business biggest success for was my uh, text messaging, letting people know like, Hey, I, I have this product coming in, or, you know, we have these sales coming up or send me or, and having that engagement, like send me an emoji about how your day is going, right. like things like that, like engage right. with your customers. They're, they're humans. They are not numbers. And I feel like that, that strategy has helped me leaps and bounds. On the SMS side, have you had any issues on a carrier standpoint of carriers blocking your texts? Yeah, absolutely. It's just a constant game of just, you know, moving numbers, moving this. Like, uh, what really gets me is the terms I can and can't use. I'm just like, this is ridiculous. You know, I've had my moments where I'm sitting there typing. I'm like, are you serious? Like, I right. can't do this right now. Right, um, right. But it's just... You know, it's the obstacles. It's just one of many obstacles that I deal with every day, and I just take it in stride. Step I'm by a, step, I'm a right? Professional problem solver is what I tell people. <laughs> you have to be. You honestly, you have to be in this space. I think overall, as an entrepreneur, and I've said this in previous episodes before, like overall, as an entrepreneur, um, you you have to be a problem solver. You have to be a firefighter. You have to put out fires, right? Uh, hopefully yeah. you can solve the problem once and it doesn't pop up again. But you and I both know that that does not happen you know, yeah, either. Yeah. As soon but as one regardless, out, another one starts. Another one's exactly right. But regardless, it's, uh, you know, if you're a business owner, you are a problem solver. But I always say, if you want to do something difficult, you start a business. If you want to do something very, 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 very difficult, you start a cannabis-based business. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm like, every other business I own is so much easier. It gave me yes. perspective. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it is difficult. But again, um, the more difficult the thing is, uh, the better you have to be as just a performer. Um, yeah. And if you can, you know, make it to the top, you make it to the top, right? Yeah. Um, so on your journey of becoming this cannabis connoisseur in all facets, um, so you started, got the first store, opened up the second store, um, but then you're also a board member. Um, why don't you talk about how you now transition from just being, you know, uh, the old store owner to now kind of actually being like a massive influence, like in, in the market as a whole. Yeah. So it, again, because I've networked, I know everyone that started this industry. I know who the key 
things are. It's about listening to people and Mm -hmm. whether oftentimes there's just some misinformation there. Like typically when someone doesn't agree with me, we'll sit down and we'll talk about that. And oftentimes it's just like a little piece of information that was missing that I was pregnant to that they weren't. Um, But just my role, what happened was uh, I constantly give public comment. I just showed up for these marijuana control board meetings because there's, like you said earlier, there's so much more to be caught with an in-person interaction than there is through Zoom. All of marijuana control board meetings are via Zoom. Originally, they were just telephonically and I had a whole slew of issues with it, but Some broken they're now on Zoom. Yeah. Thank you, COVID. Um, but I would just show up and I'd give my public comment and not from... You know, it got the AMIA looking at me like, hey, this girl has consistently given public comments. She's extremely knowledgeable. She's seeing issues before we even see issues. And that's how I got brought in as a board member for the Alaska Marijuana Industry Association and how I got nominated for the chair position for public relations and governance. And then the governor put his eye on me and I applied for the Marijuana Control Board. Um, You can serve three year terms three consecutive, so up to nine years per statute 1738. And in January, um, he chose me as his nominee and appointee, but I still had a legislative process um, that I went through on May 7th, where all all our legislators, all 40 House reps and 20 senators had to vote for me. And I had to have at least 31 of their votes in order to serve this position. And I got all 60. Yeah, I was, that was like, it still gives me goosebumps, yeah. still a really cool experience. But now it's like, I have all these people coming at me and it's being a great listener. Oftentimes people just want you to listen because, you know, I have solutions and it might only be address a part of the problem, but together listening to people, we, we will be able to find the, the solutions. And that's something that I did through my public comment. You can give people all day long. This is my problem. Fix it. Well, how about you provide a solution? If you've given so much thought to the problem, what's the solution? Because, you know, my mind can be somewhere else. So that's one thing I I always tell people. I'm like, if you're going to give public comment and you have a problem, try to give some solutions. Because oftentimes what happened in my case was, you know, let's say in the state of Alaska for our uh, uh, conventions, we were only allowed to bring up to one ounce of marijuana and we'd have to transfer it through metric to the venue and transfer it back at the end of the night. Well, um, so I also do leaf bowl here in the state of Alaska and I'm the point where everyone brings their product into my store and I get all the judges kits ready for the judges. And one of the problems I had was I wanted to display all this beautiful product that came in for leaf bowl, but I had, I could bring in every one of every single edible I could bring in one of every single concentrate, but I could only bring in one ounce. And I was, so I went to them and it's like, I have um, about 70 different strains that got entered into this leaf bowl. And you you do the math there. You divide that by 28 and you're not left with much. Um, Here's some crumbs to look at. So what I did was I went before the marijuana control board and I told them, I was like, I brought 69 grams of concentrate, over a hundred edibles. But per your regulations, I was only allowed to bring one ounce of marijuana. If you trust me to bring 69 grams of concentrate and 100 edibles, I think I should have the leeway to bring one ounce of each strain. We we had time under our belt at that point. They could see that we were great actors because the original board was very much like, you know, all of these hooligans are going to get into this industry, but we're all business owners, as you know. Right. And because I provided a solution. I told them exactly what statute needed to be changed and the verbiage that they needed to change. That meaning they created a regulations project and did just that. And within a year, that was completely changed. And by the next leaf bowl, I was able to bring one ounce of each strain. And that was pretty awesome. Did, did you ever think when you first started, you know, at, at, in the kitchen with a couple of friends that you would be where you are right now? Absolutely not. <laughs> I still look back and I'm like, you would have told me even in my twenties, like you're going to, you're going to be that woman for the state of Alaska that represents everyone. And, or even that I was going to own a dispensary. I'd, I would have told you, you are out of your mind. Like I I went through a lot through my twenties, you know, um, I was actually raised Mormon and I started on that path and I started a family and that's, that was a path I was originally on. And, 
you would have told me this was my future. I would have told you you're on drugs legitimately. <laughs> out, out of all the businesses that you could have picked, you yeah. know, this is the one, you know, to, you know, tell, tell uh, a store, but you know, um, I, I felt really passionately that I wasn't right. a bad person in it. And right. it got me into this industry. And I tell people, I'm like, you never know what your future is. I had no idea. You took, I thought I had to be, you know, at least another 10 years older before the governor mm. would really look at me and be like, hey, I would like you to serve on my marijuana control board. I, I couldn't have foreseen any of this, but what I could do every day was wake up and do my best. And that's what I do. Nice. nice. And it's gotten me here. Yeah. And I'm really excited to represent my industry. It's pretty much, it's, it's an amazing honor. I like that. Wake up and do my best. Yeah. That's that's really nice. That might be the title of the video. We'll see. <laughs> Unless or you could find another. percent is good enough because I'm right. a little bit of a perfectionist and I've gotten to a point where I'm like, it's 80% there, Bailey, just submit it. <laughs> right, right, right. So you have a very interesting perspective, I think, over the industry as a whole. You have what I would consider in this situation, both a micro, micro perspective as a consumer a micro perspective as a uh, retail owner, and then a macro perspective of legislation as a whole, at least in your state. Yeah. So where do you see the future of the cannabis industry heading right now? Where I see it going is a couple different paths. Mm -hmm. We have two avenues of federal legalization where one, the FDA gets involved. The other, state rights. I hope that we go state rights. I think that's the, that's the, the better path for us because we sure. get the FDA involved. If you've looked at tobacco, you have to know people, you have to have a lot of money and that's going to, that's going to kill a lot of us, um, mm -hmm. small people. And I would say I'm, I'm small. I'm just yeah. an Alaskan yeah. who opened a business, who wanted to do something crazy and went on that adventure. And did but, it. And also did it. Don't forget <laughs> that. And, and you did it. <laughs> and, but it helps off. Also often get asked, when do you expect federal legalization? Mm. You know, when I started my business, uh, what, eight, 10 years ago now, it was, oh, here in a couple of years. Now it's like, I don't, even with rescheduling, I don't know. It could be tomorrow. It could be 10 years from now. It, you know, I've dealt with my own legislation and I understand the complexities. Mm -hmm. We just got our, uh, our tax restructure bill thrown out. Because of the chair of the state finance committee does not care for our industry. They were able to kill it by not presenting it to the rest of the state finance. They're right. able to choose that. So there's so many moving parts. I really don't know. But that's why I tell everyone, I'm like, pay attention to the day to day. That's mm -hmm. going to be really important. All of these micro movements are pointing us in a direction. And that's why we have to be involved. If we don't get involved and we get and we keep sitting back and waiting for something big to happen, it's not necessarily going to be in our favor. But if we pay attention to all the little micro movements and all the key players in the industry, we can help move it into a avenue that is advantageous for all of us owners currently operating. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If we don't, we could have some big problems with some of the really, really, and we all know, we know the big corporations are going to get involved. That's going to change the lay of the land. And I'm not sure what that's going to look like, right. to be honest. Are you optimistic? Naturally, yes, I'm optimistic. That's bitten me in the butt a couple times. So it makes me a little, where you see that hesitancy. I'm optimistic if everyone does their part. And everyone mm. pays attention to what's happening and gives that public comment and make sure that they're talking to their legislatures, their senators, their house reps, their congressmen. I think we could really do a lot of good that way. But it is one foot in front of the other. And it can go down a couple different paths, especially for Alaskans. Um, our cultivation market, we have some of the highest energy costs in the state. Uh, it's, you know, we don't have the natural climate to grow. There's only one cultivator, um, Rosie Creek Farm up in Fairbanks that actually grows in Alaskan soil under the Alaskan sun. But as we know, those have to be autoflower. Um, Cause like right now our sun doesn't go down. I mean, it was 1230 last night and it was still light out. <laughs> so we have like a really unique growing atmosphere for cannabis yeah. and hemp. But uh, what's going to happen when we have importation, when right now all of these mm. cultivators in our state grow for us recreational retailers, 
you know, like my cut, my consumers are going to ask for me to bring in out of state product. They're going to want to see flour from California. They're going to want to see flour from Colorado in Washington. They're going to want to see products from there. So what does that mean from our market? And that's something that I'm trying to anticipate for uh, my industry and try to help through regulation prior to that happening. I keep telling everyone on the board, I'm like, we cannot be reactive. We have to be proactive. If you want to uh, create a industry that's sustainable, we have to be proactive. Mm-hmm. We can't keep doing this reactive stuff. Oh, something changed. Oh, they figured out how to convert CBD to THC now. What do we do? Yeah, right. So what advice would you give yourself if you were to start all over again? Good question. I'd give myself more credit when it comes to my perspective on how to operate businesses Mm -hmm. and the allocation of funds. I would have done things a little bit differently with my staff initially. There's Mm -hmm. a couple things that I would change. Nothing massive, but, you know, I've, I've had a lot of lessons learned now. And I would be, I would tell myself, like, these are the obstacles. These were the solutions. Make your decision. All right. Right. So when you say allocation of funds, do you mean raising more capital so that you can move faster? Do you mean um, being yeah, smarter I, with how you allocated your money? Yeah, smarter with how I allocated okay. funds. Because um, there was things that I could not have perceived. Um, we had one of our uh, high times came up to the state of Alaska. And obviously, I, I wanted to be the presenting sponsor. And I was. Right. That was not a great use of my funds. It Mm. was a large amount. And the way they left our industry after they left the state was extremely harmful. And I wish I would have known that. I wish I would have known and saw some of the signs of like, "Mm, this might not be the best way to utilize those funds. But again, you know, I have to offer myself forgiveness. Like you don't know until you know. Um, I wish I would have, you know, had some uh, information from people down in lower 48 that had dealt with them, but I didn't. I made the best decisions I could with the information I had on hand, and uh, those funds could have been better utilized in my right. opinion. Right. So is, is the lesson in that situation to uh, maybe get more insight of referrals of people who you intend to spend a lot of money with? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you, I, you know, you see this name and I know my customers recognize this name. And so that was really important mm. to me, but there's more than just that name. And I also have a morality in the way that my industry was left really upset me. So yeah. had I done a little bit more of that research, which is what I do now, I, uh, I would have saved myself some heartache. Right, right. So we also have this little segment where we ask the previous guest uh, on the podcast to ask the next 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 oh, guest <laughs> a question, so they don't know who you are. Um, yeah. And uh, I think you got away easy because this one seems pretty simple, but you know, would love to hear your answer, anyways. Um, I, I got into it. The, the question is: Is what made you get into the industry um, and your passion for the plant? Um, so, so you can start with that. I did get away easy on this one. <laughs> yes, you did. What yes, got me did. into this industry was just wanting to do what was right, wanting to mm. put out that premium product. Every time I did find product, cause I didn't want to put myself out there too much in the illicit market or the legacy market, as I call it now. Um, I just wanted to find that premium product and make it so my customers, they didn't have to go through what I went through. They know mm. that it's safe. They know that when they, you know, decarboxylated that it's not going to be harmful. Uh, it, that really motivated me to open my own retail. And the question that you have for the next person I interview? Oh, um, how do you participate in your governance of your industry? Ooh, you got an easy one. You're giving a tough one back. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I ask people, too many people are sitting back and right. not paying attention. Just submit a letter, submit some public comment. The more voices heard, the better decisions our, our legislators can make, our board members can make, our regulators can make. Put the information out there because oftentimes I'll hear from people, you know, this is this problem and this is what's going on. And I'm like, I don't think they've solved that. Have you said something? No. Mm -hmm. Then how can they change it? They can't. They don't know there's a problem in the first place. It's not going to get changed. Right. Right. It's not enough, uh, you know, kind of going to the bar with some friends and complaining about your day-to-day problems. You have to actually, you know, kind of say it to the people. You got to do something about it. (laughs) 
So what's next in store for uh, for you um, slash this tour over the next couple of years? Um, so what's next for me is I'm actually working with uh, potentially a grow in a manufacturer and getting involved into that end of things. I'm actually very excited about the manufacturing of products because I'm like, ooh, look at that vacuum oven. <laughs> I'm very scientifically minded. So I get mm -hmm. really excited about all the like gadgets and gizmos and the processes of how we strip this biomass and uh, take those cannabinoids off. So that's kind of my next step. I've also been doing a lot of speaking in education, whether it's police departments, school districts. Um, I actually applied for MJ BizCon to be a speaker there to talk oh, about nice. how how the art of making change is uh, what I presented to them. So we'll see if I get to do that. Um, things like that. That is my future. I continue to want to play that advocacy role and educate people because I think oftentimes they just don't know what to do. In their, it's pretty simple. Once once you figure out who to ask questions to and what those processes are, the answers become clear and we can right. create change. Right. Right. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to get in touch? Um, they can find me at uh, stuartconsultingak.com. That's my consulting business. They can find me on Instagram at Stuart Consulting or uh, thegreenjarak.com. Uh, awesome. Well, Bailey, um, I just wanted to say that this was a really insightful call. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you previously, but I, I don't know if I've had anyone on the show that's had such a depth and width of knowledge at their disposal, right? And it's not because you snapped your fingers and all this knowledge is kind of absorbed into your head. Um, as we mentioned it onto this podcast, uh, it is the result of you taking one step at a time. Sometimes you fall down the stairs, but you, you yeah. have clearly shown that you get back up um, and you take things one step at a time and you wake up, you do your best every single day and then you get at it. So just wanted to say thank you for taking the time out of your day for hopping on this podcast. Um, it was a really, really awesome one. And thank you. yeah, this was great. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's always fun to be able to talk about the things I love. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Well, everyone, um, that's it for this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Kwan, and I will see y'all later. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Dispensary Marketing Podcast. My name is Brandon Kwan, and I'm the founder of Cannabud Marketing, the number one marketing agency of choice for dispensaries, both in the United States and in Canada. If you ever want to get in touch with me about any marketing strategies, tips, and tricks, I can definitely help you. Just go visit our website at cannabudmarketing.com. That's C-A- N-N-A-B-U-D marketing.com or just check the links in the description below. Until next time, talk to you later. Bye.